March 4th, 2013. The world is rocked by a Harlem Shake outbreak. Scientists boldly claim to have directly measured the polarization of light, and famed composer Antonio Vivaldi celebrated his 335th birthday. Fascinating because at this point, he'd spent the last 272 years rather dead. However, on this day, there was an event that overshadowed everything, an act so powerful that it permanently altered a segment of humanity. On March 4th, 2013, the One Piece manga began weekly serialization of the Dress Rosa arc. Easily the most controversial story in the entire series, but don't take my word for it. It was different. It was really different. It is very ambitious. It might be controversial. Very controversial. I was scared of reading it. What even was that? It drove me to the point of near insanity. It was painful. Oh, man. This was a really big deal, you know? Too ambitious. Too long. Too many characters. This isn't gonna be easy. I could barely keep track of everything that was happening. Health mission in like Spain. Split up the crew. It's always walking all over the place. Okay, there's a birdcage now. Like, oh my god. All these people doing all these different things. It's really hard to keep track of like who is who. Giola? Wow, G! Giant stone man. Vacuum women. Lucy, okay. Stupid goofy face. He's Steven Tyler. It's a big thumbs down from Astro. We are in for a showdown, and it's probably going to take a while. Endless Rebecca flashback. This boy right here, filler dugong arc. I feel like that's a massive red flag. Stupid choice. And then all, all of a sudden it just becomes a mess. Mm -hmm. What is this? Bad animation. Big fist, hits, string. What is happening? Did not make any sense to me. I couldn't figure it out. It was messed up. What was the reason? It probably felt like the worst arc of all time. I'm not saying to do that. Dress Rosa was the point where I was like, this needs to end. You know, that was, a, that was a rather negative way to start a video, wasn't it? Then again, truth be told, even me, you know, the, the guy whose entire life is about being a One Piece talker, even my feelings on Dress Rosa, they're pretty mixed to say the least. It's not as simple as saying that Dress Rosa is bad because of uh, X, and in fact, it doesn't even necessarily start with the arc itself. There's a fair bit to understand before getting into all of this, and with that in mind, quick recap. One Piece is an ongoing Japanese manga series that began in 1997, written and illustrated by Ichiro Oda, a man who often prefers to depict himself as an anthropomorphic fish. The general premise follows our plucky young protagonist, Monkey D. Luffy, as he journeys across the world on a quest to become the Pirate King. Along the way, he gathers a crew, some of which have long noses and some of which do not. All of which have dreams though, and together they sail throughout the Grand Line, stopping at various islands, overcoming assorted challenges, and perpetually moving on with their journey. And this journey is taken so long that almost 24 years later, it still has yet to conclude, resulting in One Piece having published over 1,000 chapters, an anime adaptation of almost as many episodes, 14 theatrically released films, roughly a gazillion games, and even a Guinness World Record for the most copies of a comic book published by a singular author. To call the series popular would be an unimaginable understatement. There's an incredible legion of fans worldwide, such as myself and this guy, uh. just to name two. Even then, over the years One Piece has had, to quote Katy Perry, it's hots and colds, yeses and noes, ins and outs, ups and downs, and there is no part of the series that better encapsulates all eight of those English words than Dress Rosa. This singular story arc is by far the most divisive in One Piece, and when I say divisive, I mean that this arc won't just cause controversy between people, but also within people. I've mixed feelings about this one. I have a love and hate relationship with the Dress Rosa arc. It really bothers me. It's a difficult child uh, because it's long and it's full of stuff. I think Oda was experimenting a lot in this arc. It has its moments, but one of the best arcs, it is not. At this point in the mammoth journey that is One Piece, we had entered what is known as the New World Era, a period that occurs after a two year in world time skip. And prior to Dress Rosa, we had gone through two fairly hefty story arcs, being Fishman Island and Punk Hazard, both of which, to be perfectly frank, somewhat disappointed the fan base in their own fun and unique ways. I wasn't a big fan of um, Punk Hazard or Fishman Island. We had just gotten two arcs that in my opinion were not great. Fishman Island was just a breeze through. And best of all, we're out of Punk Hazard. Some commonly cited reasons for this include. I actually like Punk Hazard. Hmm. 
All right, well, there you go. There's always one. But commonly cited reasons for this include an uninspiring main antagonist, a lack of serious challenge, and the general idea that both were just a little bit too long for what they ultimately ended up accomplishing. Which in real world time, these two arcs were published between 2010 to early 2013, so we're looking at a, a couple of years of patience here. With that said, they were quite forgivable experiences because they were both clearly building up to something. Our first major conflict and saga climax in the New World Era. However, it's fair to say that after having experienced two fairly, you know, neutral offerings, that there was now an extraordinary amount of pressure on Dressrosa to deliver the juicy, juicy goods. I was insanely hyped for Dressrosa. To me, I was like, wow, there's so much to expect with Dressrosa. I was hyped about everything. I was really excited uh, for what was to come. Yeah, I was actually really hyped to, you know, read Dressrosa. Dressrosa kind of seemed like the pinnacle of what the entire journey was going to be. And it was so hype. At the time, it was so hype. My expectations were <laughs> skyrocketing. Oh, man. That is an absolutely insane amount of pressure, and as a result, Dressrosa was very much doomed from the beginning to be under this microscope of intense scrutiny, which had not applied to anything that had come before it. This arc needed to deliver perfectly, efficiently, and ideally, rather quickly. Luckily, what the story was promising right at the outset had quite a bit going for it. Seeing Law get on board for this, Type for Law's backstory because I knew like this when like this kind of Law's arc. I wanted to see how the dynamics between Law and the Straw Hats would play out. Him and the Straw Hats have this plan to take down the Flamingo. All right, we're we're taking on another warlord, one of the best villains in the series, and we knew the Dolph Flamingo was a very powerful character. And this felt like the first opportunity post time skip for the story to really kind of flex his muscles. So essentially, all we needed to do was infiltrate an island, wreck a factory, beat up some Flamingo dude, and call it a day. Seems simple enough, yeah. So. How could something that straightforward go ever, ever so wrong? There are too many goddamn characters. There, there are a lot. There are too many characters. Majority of the character is uh, forgettable. I could not, I couldn't remember them. I don't remember the names and I do not care. <laughs> Quiz time. For all of you wonderful Dress Rosa alumni, I have a very simple question. How many characters were featured during this arc? And I'll give you a fighting chance. Let's say, tell me how many characters there were to the nearest 10. However, in exchange, should you be incorrect, then your punishment will be to subscribe to the Grand Line Review, thus resulting in regular injections of One Piece culture administered straight into your YouTube feed. Very exciting stuff, so choose your number now and let's ask ourselves, how many characters are there in Dress Rosa? I'd say maybe like 40 characters. 40. 40. 45. 37. Two dozen. A lot. 40 to 60. 50. 50. 60. 60. 69. Sorry about that. Oh my god. 80? There are just a lot of characters actually in this arc. You guys are way off. Let's put it this way. You can boil the core of Dress Rosa down to exactly three characters, Luffy, Law, and Doflamingo. Together in this triangle, they form a mighty menage a character, your classic battle of accessories, two hatted individuals versus one pair of sinister sunglasses. We're going to call these our primary art characters, but where things become immediately more insane is when we start to incorporate secondary characters. So obviously we have the rest of the straw hat, so that's another eight. Doflamingo also has his own crew to be explored, which means three executive officers and nine army officers. Along with that, we cannot forget the Dress Rosa royalty, the relevant Marines, the Revolutionary Army, the flashback exclusive characters, the Tontada tribe, the Wano characters, because we're setting up that story as well. Then there's the individual actors, such as Jesus Burgess, Caesar Clown, Bellamy, and oh, I feel like I'm forgetting something, something important. Oh uh, yeah, the roughly one billion contestants from the Corridor Coliseum, which not counting the characters we've already named is only 27, but 27 is is still a lot. That's like half the characters introduced in the entire East Blue saga, all within this one nifty Colosseum. Because they were introduced so quickly and I thought we wouldn't get enough time to learn about all of them. You don't really get to know them as well as I would personally prefer. They also felt like a very gimmicky. Cactus Bandit, that guy. What? What was the point of him? Cannon fodder, you know, they weren't meant to be big like those bounty hunters. Maybe make the bounty hunters actually do something, I don't know. We spend way too many, too much time with them and they're not really that important to the story. God bless G, okay? Hey, 
all with you, buddy. But we didn't need them. Like, who's this guy? Who's that guy? That's a fish, man. Is that guy a jacket? I mean, you know, I could probably do without the jacket guy. I think that Oda realized that he could do without the jacket guy as well, because Kelly Funk and Bobby Funk completely disappeared during Dress Rosa, never to be seen again. But if you've lost count of how many characters we've mentioned so far, then that is to be expected. But I do have some bad news for you, because we're not done yet. Dress Rosa also comes equipped with a wide range of tertiary existences, like Gats, Gambia, and Kewin. Remember Kewin? Probably not. And if you do, be honest, you probably didn't remember her name. Nor should you need to, because she sucked. Like, I mean, literally with a vacuum and everything. But we've also got tertiary flashback characters as well. In fact, even Garp appears in a flashback. Then there's the epilogue Marines, the Big Mom Pirate show up at one point, because that's another arc we're setting up. Blackbeard's here on a Den Den Mushy. And look, there's even more named members of the Tom Tata tribe. That is just excellent. All of which brings us to a grand total of 105 characters featured during the arc. So if you didn't guess around the 100 mark, then you need to do the subscribe thing. And please do say hi in the comments below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet. Welcome. It does get crazier though, because this I want to emphasize is not an exhaustive list as there is also a layer of characters that don't even really qualify as tertiary for our purposes here, such as the, the spiky melon head guy, you know the one? Or Sengoku's gorilla friend, whose name is Uho apparently. And if you add in all of the spiky gorilla characters, then we're talking closer to the 150 to 200 mark. But including them does start to get a little bit ridiculous because they're less like characters to be explored and more akin to living set dressing. In fact, you know that door homie on Whole Cake Island that the fire tank pirates kind of brutally murdered in our fun pirate manga? Well, she was literal living set dressing and Dress Rosa features an avalanche of exactly that sort of character. What's really wild though, is that even if you took away all of the set dressing individuals and all of the tertiary characters, you would still be left with 83 primary and secondary characters that you do need to know and follow during the arc. And 83 is a big number. No, it is not as big as 84, but it is decidedly larger than 82, which is an already big number in its own right. So with that in mind, it is easy to see how people could get overloaded by the sheer flood of names, motivations, designs, and stories all within this one single arc. There's too many characters to follow. It was obnoxious, the amount of characters. It's hard to keep track of all of them the first time you read through. I can barely remember most of the characters from this arc. None of them were that interesting. There's kind of there. Yeah, like I'm just like, I don't really care about you. And many of these names I want to emphasize are completely new and that does make a big difference because we had a comparable amount of characters in the Marine for Dark, for example. But the great advantage that arc has is that we already knew most of them. They'd been slowly introduced to us over the course of about a decade and they'd had that opportunity to build a relationship with the readers. Dress Rosa characters for the most part did not have that luxury. And no, a big number alone does not empirically mean that there are quote, too many characters because that's very subjective and I promise we will get to that. However, when you have all of these people, then you need to, you know, actually do something with them. And that ends up creating Dress Rosa's second problem. Was excruciatingly long. Is Dress Rosa too long? Yes. It felt really drawn out and a lot going on. It was, and it was trying to introduce too, too many things. The issue of when Oda's vision for the world he's created collides with the reality of storytelling. The week to week read was horrific. The fact that it took two and a half years to just complete an arc is a bit too long. I think it takes 50 chapters inside the birdcage. It's longer than the entirety of Ennis Lobby. Too long. Like it is way too long. Why does it need to be that long? So if we were to quantify One Piece arcs into some sort of physical substance, and for argument's sake, let's take two objects at random, uh, ink and paper, then your classic East Blue arc would be about this big. Then Punk Hazard, the arc that comes immediately before Dress Rosa is about, you know, this size. Meanwhile, Dress Rosa would be this. It's, uh, it's quite heavy to hold, actually. It's a pretty serious chunk of story that takes place over the course of 102 manga chapters. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, well, a chapter contains roughly 18 pages. So getting through Dress Rosa means reading almost 2,000 of these here bad boys. Dress Rosa is longer than most manga series, to be completely honest. I appreciate your honesty, sir. And this statement is not at all an exaggeration because you could read the entirety of Death Note, Chainsaw Man, or both parts one and two of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure 
adventure in roughly the same amount of time as it would take you to tackle this singular One Piece arc. Which in and of itself is not a bad thing. I mean, look, yes, this is, it's a lot of books, but it's manageable. You could probably blast through these in a couple, maybe even a single day if you've got literally nothing else to do, but that's very much a luxury of retrospect. The thing to keep in mind about One Piece is that it is published on a weekly basis. That means one chapter every week, with a break roughly once a month. And that means that Dress Rosa began publication on March 4th, 2013. However, it did not conclude until September 28th, 2015. So if you were reading weekly, that is about two and a half years. In fact, if you were reading weekly, then you would have experienced the month of March three times over while still engaged in this single arc. But so what you say, I mean, we as a society, we wait for things, it's what we do. Like we waited just over two years to see three Lord of the Rings films play out. So what's the big deal? Tell me. Tell me now. Yeah, all right, let's just, let's just calm your phone. Because another fascinating issue pops up because length isn't just a problem in regards to real world publishing time, but also the in world time of the story. And that happens to be due to the fact that the entirety of Dress Rosa predominantly takes place over the course of a single day. Two years for one day is insane. 118 episodes-ish for a day is really whack to me. I just, I remember many times thinking like, okay, can we please move on? Oh my God, this is going on forever. Big old slog. I uh, completely stopped uh, reading for a while, One Piece. I kind of zoned out when I was watching and reading because I, lost interest. In addition to that, unlike the Lord of the Rings example, it's not like we're waiting for huge chunks of story to be dumped on us once a year. Rather, what happened is that we were being drip fed a weekly experience which felt much more painful than it should have because everything took place during a singular day. In fact, even less because the sun doesn't even go down until the conclusion. So more accurately, we could call it a single morning and or afternoon. And as a result, there were many points during Dress Rosa where the sheer length of the arc versus the amount of time passing in world made the experience feel quite stagnant. There was a grand frustration at a perceived lack of progress because it's entirely possible that by a year and a half into reading this story, you had only progressed a couple of hours in world. And this feeling was so, so common that it was actually given a diagnosis within the illustrious and not at all overreactive online fan base, with this condition becoming known as Dress Rosa Fatigue, a term that would then be rebranded as Arc Fatigue in order to apply to future installments of the story. And unfortunately, characters and language we're not going to be the last of Dress Rosa's core problems. As from here, things would begin a fairly brutal domino effect and factors that would not normally be issues all of a sudden evolved into these massive headaches, such as the very basic idea of the aesthetics were cool, cool at first. It's kind of lacking things that other arcs give us. It's not the most original of Island. It's a perfectly serviceable town. But as far as One Piece goes, perfectly serviceable is actually kind of disappointing. It's always daytime. It's always the same day. Everything happens within 24 hours. It is boring. At face value, there's nothing wrong with the island of Dress Rosa itself. It's quite beautiful, heavily inspired by Spanish architecture and culture and Spain. Look, it's great. I love Spain. I've been to Spain. Here's proof. Look at me. I'm Spaining. In fact, the only issue I can really take with the country is that it's rather unfortunately grounded in the real world, which One Piece more often than not is not. As subjective as this sort of thing tends to be, I would never go so far as to call the island boring. In fact, quite the opposite. It is a stupidly stunning location, but at the same time, if you've gotten this far in the series, then you've seen some pretty beyond phenomenal stuff already. Dress Rosa is a dose of heightened reality, whereas the entire proposition of One Piece as a whole is to experience this grand fantastical adventure where we discover dinosaurs on prehistoric islands, fight gods in the clouds, and dive deep to explore magical underwater cities. Fishman Island, you can say what you want about Fishman Island. Fishman Island looks great. Fishman Island was so fun and vibrant looking. Punk Hazard, which was half fire, half ice, seeing like, how did that even happen? Compared to the fantasy of the whole cake island or the stunning scenery of Ennis Lobby, the Dress Roses Island isn't like very interesting at all. I wouldn't say it's like, it's not very exciting or boring. Like, it is kind of, it's meh. Which isn't to say that heightened reality never happens or doesn't work in One Piece specifically. I mean, we have Water 7, for example, which is basically Super Venice. But that works very well because we only spent about 40 chapters there before boarding the sea train to any Sobby. And during those 40 chapters, we saw the island during the day, we saw it at sunset, we saw it at night, we saw it whilst it was on fire, and whilst in the midst of a natural disaster, there was a ton of aesthetic variety. But with Dress Rosa, we were there for more than twice as long, and for all intents and purposes, 
there was only ever one atmospheric setting being midday sunny afternoon. And at that point, it really doesn't matter how beautifully crafted your setting is. If that's all one is looking at for two and a half years straight, that setting is going to wear out and risk becoming aesthetically flat. Thus adding another element to dress Rosa fatigue because your eyes just need something, anything else to look at. Personally, I remember getting to Zoe and my eyes like oh, metaphorically came because we, we were just being treated to something that wasn't dress Rosa. It isn't something super special. And that's kind of boring <laughs> think about it. The longer it went on, the more boring it got. I, I can see it getting environmentally boring on a weekly basis. And it was a bit for me too, as a rear. The geography is what I hate most about Chris Rosa. Geographically, geographically. Jeep. So all of this is kind of wild because after a while, Dress Rose was being compared to Punk Hazard and Fishman Island. And not only that, it was being compared in an unfavorable way, which seemed utterly unimaginable when we were first starting the arc. The thing is, those were not the only arcs at the time that Dress Rose was being frequently compared to. And a big name that we haven't mentioned up until this point just so happens to be... That it's kind of a retread of Alabasta, honestly. I don't like how much it mirrored Alabasta. So I think it's undeniable that there are a lot of similarities between Dressrosa to Alabasta. One could even say that Dressrosa was an intensified post time skip version of Alabasta. One could, and I suppose certainly has now said that. Alabaster, in case you're unaware, was the first properly big climactic arc in One Piece. It had a whole saga of build up spanning multiple arcs, villains, locations, and is remembered incredibly fondly by the large majority of the fan base for being that first experience of Mmm, peak One Piece. However, the reason why this nostalgia-filled arc becomes relevant when talking about Dress Rosa is because the two, well, they share quite a few common core features, thus resulting in the overall impression of, hey, haven't I seen that somewhere before? So let us now embark on an exciting journey of symmetry. Both arcs involve a member of the Seven Warlords who has manipulated an entire nation into loving them. Both antagonists have a wide ranging crew that ultimately get paired off in one versus one fights during the climax. Both of them involve a king in crisis with a dead queen and the rightful royal family being hated by a large segment of the population. Both arcs see a princess from said royal family temporarily joining the bad guys organization. Both have a femme fatale who proves integral to overall victory on the island. And yes, Viola doubles as both the princess and the femme fatale on Dress Rosa, there is also another princess, however, in Rebecca. Although I think we all know who the true princess of this arc is. It's Law, don't deny it. Anyway, both islands contain a rebel army set on overthrowing the monarchy, led by a relatively young male. In Kuros' case, uh, I guess it's relative to the age of King Riku, he's younger. The key to the operation with both villainous organizations involves an illegal substance. On both islands, we feature a marine anti-hero who ultimately relinquishes delivery of justice to the very pirates that he was brought in to stop. And and of course, both arcs feature a surprise appearance from an older brother of Luffy who wield the exact same fruit and end up fighting the marine anti-hero on Luffy's behalf. Now, if I was to be particularly sassy, then I would say something like, isn't it weird that the mirror world was first introduced to us on Whole Cake Island when we'd been experiencing it the entire time on Dress Rosa? Familiarity definitely exists within these core elements. But to be fair, many of these features are also common across One Piece arcs as a whole, just, you know, not usually usually so bundled together. Because to be even more fair, you would be hard pressed to find a story that resembles Alabaster more than Dress Rosa. And while there are certainly many key differences that do separate the two arcs, the fact that so many core elements can be compared is just another in a long line of issues that was compounding Dress Rosa. Which to do a fun little recap, there are now over 100 relevant characters to keep track of. The arc was published over an excruciating two and a half years. By that point, the setting was getting quite stale. And on top of everything, the story itself was a little bit too on the familiar side for a lot of fans. But here's the thing. It didn't matter what happened. I was down for the ride. I was down for it 100%. At this stage, we've been very negative about this whole endeavor thus far. And to be as brutally honest as possible, a lot of what has been said, even by me, can be summed up as old man yells at cloud. I don't think it's as bad as people say. It's long, but I feel like, I mean, I didn't mind. I mean, it is dense 
and very long but at the same time i think it took the time it needed to tell its story if you want to tell a really good story then take the time to tell the really good story there's no such thing as too much one piece of any sort and the thing about length is that nowadays it's an all but irrelevant concern because you can read dress rosa at your own pace you're not bound by a weekly release schedule and if you're feeling a bit bored of a certain part well you can just skim and speed up so rather than say spending months in the corridor coliseum you are now spending potentially minutes and that effectively dispels the problem with the setting as well that's if you had an issue with the setting in the first place the whole setting and everything looked super cool because i have an affin affinity for spain and the red dress rosa had like that spanish flair to it i was excited about it i've been to spain on holiday a few times and seeing a fantasy take on the place was a lot of fun we get to see this magical world where toys and people coincide together happily so what remains? Well, Dress Rosa is still undeniably Alabaster-esque, but you could also take that as a grand compliment. I mean, adopting the core elements of one of the most memorable stories in the series and significantly upscaling them sounds like a pretty guaranteed formula for success, even if it is you know, a little bit repetitive. So long as it works, it shouldn't really matter. And that leaves us with one issue. No, there are not too many characters in Dress Rosa. I think the characters was fine. Not too much. Let me throw up air quotes when I say that. There's never enough characters, so keep bringing them all. And we did indeed come quite close to bringing them all. I mean, there is about a billion of them, but so long as these characters are captivating and fun to follow, that should never be an issue. In fact, a whole ton of the most memorable figures in One Piece were introduced during this very arc, leading to a veritable tsunami of new fan favorites. How can you pick a favorite? This guy is my favorite. Well, I'm a blue gaily stain. Rocinante. Elizabello II with his king punch. Boom! It's probably Kiros. Kairos. I don't know if it's Kairos or Kiros. Baby five. Baby five. Cavendish. Cavendish. One Piece does not have enough pretty men, and I think there needs to be way more. Senor Pink. Senor Pink. Senor Pink! Really do like Senor Pink. In this house, we stand Senor Pink. We don't dress like him, though. Uh, we don't do that. So hot boiled! Hot boiled indeed. And not only that, but Dress Rosa came packing with some pretty serious power behind it because if I was to identify one ingredient that could immediately elevate any One Piece arc, then my easy answer would be the addition of a Marine Admiral. Fujitora is up there as well. I think he's one of the most interesting admirals. I think that he offers an interesting perspective. He has seen the world for what it is, didn't like what he saw. Of all the Marine Admirals, he's the one that seems most concerned with everyone well-being and actually upholding the law. He's so cool. I love his character design. I love the way he talks, the way he thinks, the way he moves. And I think his powers are like really cool. At the same time, I think we do know who the unequivocal king of Dressrosa is, and no, it's not Doflamingo or King Riku. No, no, no. The biggest breakout presence of this story is in fact a barrier chicken. Bartolomeo is a really fun one. Starting out being an a-hole to everyone and being a jerk. I hated him at first and then he just became like one of the most endearing, funny characters. Bartolomeo, I just loved him. My man, Bartolome Bartolomeo. <laughs> ba Bartolomeo? Didn't Otis say that he was the embodiment of what he saw as the One Piece fandom? And it's like, oh! Zoro noticed me, it's so great! Luffy's in bar. It was very relatable. How could I not love a character who seems to be modeled after us all? Is that narcissistic? Who doesn't love Bartolomeo? I don't like Bartolomeo. And whilst not liking Bartolomeo may be a demonstrably minority opinion, there is also a great risk with introducing so many characters, particularly if some of them, you know, do fit the description of being hated by one and all. And I'm not pointing fingers at anyone in particular, mostly because I don't think I can draw more attention to Treble than he already generates simply by existing. The most negative thing about Dressrosa? Treble. Treble. He sucks. I hate him. I did not like that character at all. Like, why does he exist? He doesn't do anything interesting. Booger boy. Him and his nee, nee. still haunt me to this day. I hate that guy. So I just wanted him to get smacked. And I, I was definitely done with snot men. I hate Sabo. I mean, okay, sure. We were talking about treble, but sure, you can insert your Sabo based opinions. I'll allow it. But even with the odd treble thrown into the mix, thus ruining our wonderful character soup, the greatest endorsement that this critical mass of characters brings is making 
making One Piece feel like a very full world. Think about this, there are over 100 individuals each playing out their own stories on this island in tandem, which results in this insanely organic and rich environment where there is detail and subtlety to be found everywhere. At all times, Dressrosa feels less like a narrative and more like a glimpse into a crumbling society, all of which pays off in a literal revolution against our main antagonist and speaking of. He is an example of a villain that lives up to the hype. I'm a guy in the shadows, sneaky guy. Doflamingo was the person who declared war on all of existence. In an arc that is very mixed, he's probably one of the strongest elements of it. I think Doflamingo defines the arc. I swear if Doflamingo wasn't the main villain, I don't think Dressrosa would be even that good. This man is the thread that binds the entire arc together. I would go so far as to say that without Doflamingo, Dressrosa would be considered undisputedly the worst arc in all of One Piece. Because if you do examine the stories generally considered to be the weaker installments of the series, one common feature they share is a very lackluster primary antagonist. It really does not matter how good everything else may be, it is not the job of Luffy and the Straw Hats to helm an arc. Instead, it falls almost entirely on the villain in question. And in this regard, Doflamingo delivers a thoroughly compelling, tension-filled, and most importantly, flamboyant experience. Doflamingo is a beast. He just brings with confidence in every single scene that he's in. Doflamingo's a terrible bastard, man. He feels threatening. <laughs> like, you're, you're, you're scary. The Heavenly Demon, uh, for a reason. He fulfills his role immaculately. There are people like him in real life. They like to control, they like to possess. Dolphy beforehand was a, like, a, what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for here? I don't wanna say magnanimous, I just like using vocabulary words here. And no, magnanimous, it may not be the correct vocabulary word to describe the heavenly demon, but a myriad of other M words do. Such as maniacal, Machiavellian, misanthropic, militant, malefic, meretricious, or even medescent, which means to become slightly damp or wet. Moist, if you will, which is yet another M word, which definitely does apply to Doflamingo in one specific case where he rather haphazardly downed a bottle of wine after having a bit of a scary dream. I mean, just look at this medescent mess of a man. But one of the only M words that cannot describe Doflamingo in any way is mundane. He's the kind of character who can just stand there and exist, not even say anything, and still be a completely compelling experience. Anytime he's on the screen or anytime he's on the page, he completely runs the show. I really, really, really love to hate him. Doflamingo just looking like this instrument Surmountable force. I was like, ah, oh, Don Quixote, Do Flamingo. I loved his name. He's always showing off his abs. I really like this. Do Flamingo inhabits an aesthetic league of his own. There is nothing, nothing at all like him elsewhere in One Piece, and there was certainly nothing that even came close to rivaling his existence on Dress Rosa. He made his mark on this story, and even now, years and years after his narrative relevance has faded, Do Flamingo is still very much in the forefront of our minds. Definitely one of the most unique villains. He's my favorite character. Well, most great stories have a great villain behind them, and Doflamingo is simply one of the best. Best villain in the series. Katakuri who? Kaido huh? Big Mom what? According to a Japanese character popularity poll conducted in 2017, Doflamingo was considered to be quite literally the most popular villain in all of One Piece, as well as the 17th most popular character overall. And four years later in the most recent World Top 100 poll, this popularity is still going strong as he ranked in 20th place. And that is Dressrosa's greatest element of salvation. This arc as a weekly experience survived on the goodwill generated by this here phenomenal Flamingo. And not just that, it also persisted through the skilled writing and creativity of Echiro Oda. Because for as long as it may have taken, I almost never hear people criticize the actual story overall, just a selection of the individual elements it took to put together. And that is a huge credit to Oda as mangaka because it indicates an extreme degree of trust and appreciation between the author and the readers. Dress Rosa was an ambitious piece, but come September 28th, 2015, Oda had done it. The final chapter was published and the experiment was over. Manga readers collectively breathed a sigh of relief as well as expressed a retrospective appreciation for the experience, the highs and lows of which had only brought us closer together as a fan base. To this day, I can speak to any older One Piece fan, and as soon as you so much as say the word Dress Rosa, it results in this like instantaneous bond. Dress Rosa? Dress Rosa. But the disaster was far from over. In fact, one could say that this entire adventure thus far was merely a prologue to disaster. An adventure that was planned and directed by a world-class navigator in Echiro Oda, but that certainly does beg the question of what would happen if this exact same adventure was given to a, uh, well, a less competent navigator. No, it, it's not good. It's not good at all.
Uh, first point here, I did not watch anything. I am a manga supremacist, and don't you forget it. Cool. Um... Noted. But for everyone else, I have another simple question. Do you think that Toei Animation adapted the Dress Rosa arc well? No. 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 Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? No. Yes. That's what I thought. Now, it should be noted that the generally poor opinion of the One Piece anime had existed long, long before Dress Rosa, and I mean long, 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 long before. We're talking like the Any Slobby era days, and a lot of the issues tend to revolve around the holy trinity of anime production being art, animation, and pacing. There's that word again, pacing, problematic little P word, as if we haven't spoken about you enough already. But as sluggish as it may have felt to read Dress Rosa weekly in the manga, watching the anime on that same weekly basis was an entirely new and rather immobile beast. The anime was in a downward spiral towards just suckiness. <laughs> there is no argument that it should have been that long. The anime took every little aspect of good storytelling and just flushed it down the toilet. I, I feel that the anime in general, it tends to really emphasize the worst of One Piece. Cause, because when it sucked, it sucked. Some of the lowest lows were was in Dressrosa in the anime. Come on. And a lot of this is due to the fact that we now have a new problem to contend with, being the Toei anime business model. The focus of which is to produce episodes of One Piece weekly, all year round. Now that might not seem so crazy at first, I mean that's exactly what the manga does. It produces weekly chapters all year round. And if those two mediums existed in a perfect one-to-one -one ratio, then we'd be pretty fine. But they don't, and we're not. We're not fine at all, at all. Because this is debatable, but the ideal adaptation rate for manga to anime is anywhere from two to three chapters per single episode, if we're talking about shonen manga that is, you know, standard 18 page weekly stuff. So for example, during the initial East Blue saga, the anime generally adapted three chapters per episode, whilst by the time we got to the Alabaster arc, that had softened to an average of two chapters per episode, which is fine. In my opinion, it's not the perfect ideal pacing, but it is good enough. Where things get really shaky, however, is when we're adapting less than that. And the astute mathematicians amongst you will have already picked up on Toei's crippling problem here. Because if you continue to adapt two to three chapters a week all year round, you will eventually catch up to and even overtake the manga production. Now under no circumstances can that be allowed to happen because Toei cannot adapt something that does not yet exist. So there are two solutions to this. Either Toei can change their business model to make less episodes a year, i.e. make One Piece a seasonal show, or, and this is the option that they decided to go with, they can ruin everything. The anime must have been really hot on the heels of the manga when it came out because there is so much fear Oh, it seems like they're adapting like half a chapter for each episode. I have never seen anything so milked out to the point where the recap takes up literally half of the entire episode. Frankly, I think the manga is obviously a lot faster and like the pacing and a lot of the reaction shots in the anime and annoying stuff like that is very present in Dressrosa. We're almost at the episode. We would get staring, stare, stare, stare. We just love to drag everything out. So a lot of episodes feel like they could have been shortened a massive amount which makes the whole arc feel even longer than it is. And there is actually stunningly good numerical reason for the arc feeling longer than it already is in the anime. And that would be because where the manga took 102 chapters to complete, the anime was able to achieve the same story with 118 episodes. Meaning that the adaptation rate for the Dressrosa arc sits on an average of 0.86 chapters per episode, as opposed to the ideal two to three. And there really is no sugarcoating this. This is abysmally poor. No shonen series should ever ever come close to having as many episodes as there are manga chapters, let alone having more episodes. It is at the point where it's quite legitimately impressive just how slowly Toei managed to go. Like imagine you're in a parked car, you're not moving at all. Then somehow imagine that you're going even slower than not moving at all. Like it boggles the mind, but that's, that's how the Dressrosa anime felt at times. I didn't want to curse, but I'm telling you I fell asleep and I woke up five, six episodes later and literally did not miss a thing. Here's the anatomy chart of the typical Dress Rosen episode. They generally had a full runtime of 23 minutes and 55 seconds, which is an awful lot of time to fill and with an allowance of 0.86 chapters, not a lot to fill it with. So to begin, almost the entirety of the first three minutes are taken up by showing Toei's logo and playing the episode opening. And the openings for One Piece are about two and a half minutes long, which is way, 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 way longer than most. After this, we have a segment of recap where we are reminded of what happened in the previous episodes and 
often even in the ones before those, which is, yeah, it's a pretty standard device in long running TV series, but One Piece takes this to a new extreme. And we almost always hit the five minute mark before the title of the episode is introduced. However, the recap does not necessarily stop after that. Especially during the Dressrosa era, we often replayed entire scenes from the prior episode. In effect, meaning that our recap, just our recap, tends to run for about four to five minutes on average. A few rare episodes are much less, and some others are much, much more. In addition to this, there is also a 30 second preview of the next episode at the end, which means that the time we have remaining for actual content is roughly 15 minutes. And I know, that, that doesn't sound like a lot but it's still far too much. So Toei went on to innovate a filler toolkit designed to exploit any and all opportunities to slow the story down. A very basic tool in this kit is of course reaction shots. Whenever a character says or does something, it's very easy to fill a few seconds of time to cut to a reaction of another character or even characters, plural, one after the other that is. As many as you can really, because each one adds a good two or three seconds of runtime, which is great value for a generally still image. In addition to this, we also have the abuse of the dramatic pause which is particularly prevalent in dialogue heavy scenes where two or more characters are speaking. A great example of this is episode 667 where Doflamingo and Fujitora are having a bit of a chit chat. And not only are they speaking painfully slowly, but there is a long three to five second pause in between each and every one of their lines before the next character speaks. It's like watching the dialogue equivalent of a buto play because dialogue heavy scenes that should take a minute or less can often end up extending into slow dragged out five minute test of endurance. And heavy action scenes are not immune from this either because also in the filler toolkit is a feature I like to call the false struggle. This is where the anime artificially inflates the difficulty of a clash at hand for either combatants or even both. And a great way to equate the false struggle is to a classical Dragon Ball Z energy beam clash. And for a fairly egregious dress rose an example, we need look no further than the final clash between Luffy and Doflamingo, the King Kong gun. The final blow against uh, Doflamingo is one thing I hate about the anime is that it made it like an actual like struggle like the flamingo is like ah and Luffy's ah in the manga the attack was instant it had a great deal of force and weight behind it but in the anime there were cuts between the impact and the effect which not only killed the tension and added more filler but it also made the force of the impact much less enjoyable in the manga it seems like bam the flamingo dead in the anime it's like he didn't have the same oomph and that's because Toei turned the clash into a false struggle, extending the action not for dramatic effect, but because it was a valuable opportunity to fill runtime. It would be like if on Alabaster, Luffy threw his famous punch up a crocodile, but instead of bursting through the pitifully conjured sand, Luffy and Crocodile had a 90 second struggle where Luffy could not penetrate the sand before finally breaking through somehow after all momentum had been stopped. And then we get to the famous flurry of punches resulting in Crocodile's defeat. And all of this is to say that Toei are the undisputed masters of taking a couple of pages of manga and turning it into a fully fledged quote unquote episode. And that practice may have been forgivable up until Dress Rosa, but when you are throttling an already slow story, then the experience can become quite noticeably excruciating. And we haven't even touched on art or animation yet. I don't like the anime adaptation of Dress Rosa at all. Probably the worst experience in the anime I've ever had. I think some of the animation is kind of ugly. Clunky animation, inconsistent human models. The animation isn't all too good. The animation can can be downright ugly. And there are these long stretches of people just kind of staring into space. <laughs> I had to stop because it was so bad. Watching Driz Rosa on a weekly basis was the first time I kind of dropped the anime. I, I decided, yeah, this is this is not it. Probably my favorite example of off-model character art in Dress Rosa is this comparison of Viola. On one side, you have Oda's masterful drawing. Here, Viola has clear emotional intent, very seductive and sultry vibe, and her body is positioned to technical perfection, very much evoking her skill as a professional flamenco dancer. But then on the other side, you have the anime's haphazard reproduction of Viola. The basic model is, it's kind of an abomination. Electing to flatten her head, expand her forehead, turn her arms into sticks, inflate her breasts into dual orbiting moons, and also shrink her waist. The end result is a very awkward model that is actually physically incapable of replicating the nuances of the character. Where in the manga, Viola has a clear, determined emotional intent, the anime makes it look more like an alien who is pretending to be Viola. You know, the illusion is uh, good enough, but everything is so slightly off that it has that uncomfortable, uncanny vibe. And that applies 
applies to every character model in Dressrosa. They are good enough at first glance, but they fall apart very quickly with an extended gaze. And the very unfortunate combo effect here is that due to Toei's deliberately slow pacing, the audience are given a lot, and I mean a lot, of time for their eyes to linger on the art. Meaning that elements that would either be forgivable or completely overlooked in a faster paced series are always at the forefront of the mind because we have literally nothing else to focus on. The story, the dialogue, the animation, all of it is moving as if some sort of sloth in a suit was in charge of putting it together, which gives you, as a viewer, almost nothing to do except focus heavily on the art. Now, with that said, all of this does come from the perspective of a consumer, and that is a very easy place to criticize from. So when it comes to art and animation, I think we need the perspective of someone who, well, who quite frankly knows what they're talking about. So I was lucky enough to find Brian Newton, who is a director extraordinaire of Rick and Morty, as well as a certified One Piece fanatic. And he was kind enough to give his opinion on this whole Dress Rosa schmuzzle. By and large, I thought the animation was fine. One uh, difference that I've been told is the fact that in uh, Japanese animation, the artist usually has a lot more autonomy over their work than in American animation production. In Japanese animation, the hand of the artist is very important. One Piece specifically is difficult because there's such a range of style and Oda himself doesn't rely on too much on character formula. When he does massive crowd shots or war sequences or battles or panels like that, it's easy to do one panel and just go nuts. But while in the anime, you have to fill out that time to have like feel the emotional weight of like friends attacking friends, lovers attacking lovers in this melee. And that takes time and effort themselves. And I actually think a lot of those sequences to convey that a sense of dread, they did a pretty remarkable job conveying that under their initial time constraints. Every arc and every animation production has its like highs and lows. And even within One Piece, even the most current stuff, I can point to several examples where the maybe the strength of the animation or compositing isn't what it should be or what it could be. But I don't think Dress Rosa was uniquely bad in any scenario. What you're responding to, and this is something that we all keep in mind, it's not just about the animation, it's about the story that's being told, whether, whether that's compelling to you or not. So that's a much more empathetic and insightful look into the anime adaptation, but I think what Brian says at the end there is extremely important. Overall, what we're responding to is the story being told. We don't watch or read media for the sake of gawking at technical proficiency, or at least most of us don't, and that is both a detriment and a benefit for Dress Rosa. In terms of detriment, the times where we are not responding in the anime are more than likely the times when we weren't particularly responding with the manga either. The anime just definitely highlights those times on a much more brutal and naked stage. However, on the flip side, in many cases, the story itself is actually good enough to overlook the anime's issues, and while they were certainly a minority, there were a lot of fans who expressed their love for Toei's adaptation. With the anime, it was I, I think it was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Toei Animation did a terrific job in most things, and especially the Dress Rose arc, it's pretty, pretty solid. It's a different experience when you get to watch it, because you get the soundtrack, you get the voice acting, you get the emotion, you get the sound effects, you, you get that whole kind of like cinematic experience. However, there is still one thing we have not spoken about that the anime is no doubt responsible for, a thing which is universally despised, and that would be... Rebecca Flashback. Oh my god. You know, Rebecca, ugh. <sighs> it's, it's truly awful. It puts me off watching it every time. It's not a bad flashback. In fact, it's quite good. But I think I've seen it more times than any of the Straw Hats flashbacks combined. We're just seeing the same flashback over and over and over and over and over. And so many flashbacks. So it got to the point every time I saw the Rebecca flashback, I just... Yeah, of course. I mean, who doesn't love the Rebecca flashback? That's my favorite show. Quiz time, again. I have another very simple question for you, which is how many times in the anime did we see the Rebecca flashback? To make this one fair, let's say give me a number to the nearest five. So if you escaped our first quiz unscathed, then should you answer this question incorrectly, your punishment will also be to subscribe to the Ground Line Review for even more consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your YouTube feed. So choose your number now and let's find out how many times we saw the Rebecca flashback in the Dress Rosa anime. I mean, 
three times? Three or four times. Five. Seven. Ten times. Ten. It's gotta be more than ten. Eight to twelve times-ish? Fifteen to twenty. The obvious answer would be too many. If you're not already, then I think you should all sit down for this because this number is going to blow your mind. There is a particularly brave Grand Fleet member by the name of NYM2606, which I think is much more of a license plate than it is a name. But this daring soul rewatched the entirety of the Dressrosa arc in order to count how many times the Rebecca flashback was shown, and the end result was a whopping 48 times. I'll say that again, there are 48 separate occasions where we cut to this flashback, whether complete or in small fragments. Compare that to the manga where we see it once, one time, one time being singular, and that's a pretty big discrepancy. But by the way, if you did not guess either 45 or I suppose 50, then you know the thing to do and welcome to the Grand Fleet, my friend. But I do feel like we all know the reason why this particular flashback was shown so, so, so many different times, and that is to fill runtime. Any time that either Rebecca or Kiros becomes relevant in an episode, any episode, well, that's an excuse to fill a couple of minutes with this story. And like most anime issues, this is not a Rebecca or even a Dress Rosa exclusive problem, but we have never seen anything even close to this scale of repetition. It's at the point where the term Rebecca flashback is one of, if not the most prolific meme in the entire One Piece fanbase. The Rebecca flashbacks on its own is not bad. It is what makes me care for Rebecca and Kiros. However, it now just gets overshadowed by the fact that it was annoying from being repeated 10 million times. It was so repetitive, it was annoying that I wish I could just punch a hole through my TV. I have flashbacks about the Rebecca flashbacks. Sometimes I wake up in the dead of night and I just see the entirety of the Rebecca flashbacks together as a compilation playing in my head. But I'd go so far as to say that the most unfortunate aspect of the situation isn't so much that they played the same footage to us 48 times. I mean, it's pretty egregious, but what's worse is that the subject of that footage was already one of the more controversial characters to have ever existed in One Piece. Oda's biggest misfire in his tenure of writing One Piece. Like every time I saw Rebecca, it was like, Get off the screen. Rebecca is the worst princess we've had. I don't care about Rebecca and Rebecca's kind of annoying. I get it, she's young. I get it, she lost her mama. I, I get it, she lost her daddy. Uh, come on. So originally I didn't plan on doing a whole Rebecca section in this video and to give you a taste of how this juicy, juicy sausage was made, I put together a questionnaire and I asked people to submit their video responses to it. There were no questions about Rebecca specifically, like about her character, her design, her role in the arc, etc. But despite that, people en masse chose to volunteer a lot of information in regards to their Rebecca related feelings. Why is she dressed like that? She's 16. Armor that a Coliseum fighter would bother wearing any Armor. When 90% of their body is armor. I think the thing that ticks me off the most about it is that it has the gall to pretend like it's armor. Can't even look at her without laughing. I think she was just there for eye candy. So it makes perfect sense that she's dressed like a Roman stripper. Dress Rosa? Well, like undress Rosa, what? Now with that said, character design is a fairly forgivable area, especially in One Piece where we get all sorts of wacky, crazy stuff thrown at us. But when Oda feeds us that, or feeds us anything, he's actually got to do something with that character to make them worth our while, which didn't, you know, exactly happen with Rebecca. For as much time as they spent fleshing out the backstory, they should have done more with Rebecca. She's not that important. Like, Vivi is very important. Shirahoshi was very important. And then as the arc went on, her character just flopped. Rebecca is just whiny, whiny, cry, cry all the time. The story doesn't even allow her the dignity of making a single decision for herself. Her presence was just super annoying to me. Rebecca as a concept is nothing new to One Piece. In most arcs involving some sort of kingdom or kingdom-like entity, there will be a princess who needs help. It's just a thing that happens. In fact, it happens so much that I've even coined a term called the princess prop, which denotes a One Piece character whose role is to fulfill this primary technical function. But even then, Rebecca takes the princess prop concept to a whole new level because as an individual, she does absolutely nothing. It's not like Vivi desperately struggling to save Alabaster. It's not like Shirahoshi facing her fears to save Fishman Island. And it's not like Yori doing, yes, actually, what is Yori doing? I don't know. It's probably some 
something though. Whereas Rebecca exists as an almost literal prop. She is a thing to inspire Luffy to fight. She is a thing for her father Kuros to protect. And she has no impact on the events of the arc outside of how she makes others feel about her. That sort of bland role combined with a fairly generic Oda design has made Rebecca one of the least popular focal elements to have ever been introduced in One Piece. And that's another thing that compounds the problems with Dressrosa because we now have what? 118 episodes where we are relying heavily on Rebecca's story for any kind of emotional resonance because she is the heart of the arc, or at least one of the hearts. Thankfully, the arc does also have Laura and Rosinante to do the heavy lifting in that regard. Otherwise, even in the manga, the implementation of Rebecca could have resulted in an even bigger disaster. And just to bring this back to the anime, this is the character that Toei chose to bombard you with about 47 more times, would you say, than was necessary for the actual story? It was a poor decision, no doubt, but it was one that was made under a series of already well out of control circumstances. Dress Rosa was a high pressured experimental affair for everyone involved, be it Oda, Shueisha, Toei, as well as the readers and watchers of One Piece. But I'll tell you what, the one thing I don't think any of us expected to come from this situation is... Those don't mix together. Dress Rosa Monopoly. Not to be confused with One Piece Monopoly, which also exists. No, this bad boy here is specifically Dress Rosa. On the back, it even says, welcome to Dress Rosa. And in this incarnation of the game, you buy characters instead of property, which I'm not gonna lie, is just a little bit strange because when the other players land on your characters, you then rent that character to that player. So it's much less about conquering the property market and more about building the best and most expensive of One Piece based brothels. You can also mortgage the character as well, so if uh, Kinemon isn't quite pulling his weight, then you can just sell him into debt for a cool 130 Monopoly monies. And there's all sorts of stupid chants and community chess, which are called flags and chess, but my favorite one is, the Don Quixote family force you to renovate your buildings. Ugh, Doflamingo, that fiend. How dare he force us to upgrade our standard of living. And look, novelty Monopoly is nothing new to, well, anything, but it is quite stunning that this Dress Rosa edition exists at all. Although it does make a lot of sense when you think about it. There was no specific demand for a Dress Rosa Monopoly, I can assure you of that. It's just that for an awfully long time, One Piece and Dress Rosa were entirely inseparable concepts. The manga began serialization of the arc on March 4th, 2013, but the anime did not air Dress Rosa's final episode until June 19th, 2016. So for a grand total of four marches over three years across two mediums, we were stuck in this one day. So no wonder when Hasbro were looking for a new Monopoly set, they thought to themselves, uh, what, what's One Piece? Oh, you mean the Dress Rosa show? Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go with that one. So look, at the very least, Dress Rosa did give us this wonderful historical artifact, but that's definitely not all. Please, Oda, Oda give, give us, us the juice. juice. Oda learned from that. Because immediately after we go to Big Mom's arc, which is almost as long or as around the same length, it felt a lot more concise. It felt a lot more s focused. How to tell a large story. I think Oda has to try not to exhaust viewers. I feel he's doing it better now in, in Wano arc. And I think he learned how to do that in Dress Rosa. Dress Rosa was an experiment in long form monk storytelling. And for all of the negative aspects that we have stated ad nauseum in this video, that experiment produced incredibly valuable results, which have gone on to serve the subs subsequent mega arcs of the series being Whole Cake Island and Wano. Both of these take a very active effort to address almost every issue that became glaringly apparent in Dress Rosa. Take setting for example. Instead of a single location, Whole Cake Island takes place in a greater empire of islands. The locations vary pretty radically from island to island, then there's also the seducing woods, the tea party atop Whole Cake Chateau, the entirely separate and stunning dimension of the mirror world, and in fact a lot of the art climax takes place at sea. So Oda is always changing the setting of the action just enough to avoid avoid that state of dress rosa fatigue. In terms of time, rather than a single day, Wano so far has taken place over the course of several weeks, which even at its slowest, and it gets pretty slow, still feels like we're making progress because we are not frozen in the same hour, maybe even the same minute of the same day. And as for the characters, well, whilst Whole Cake Island and Wano feature an undoubtedly larger cast than dress rosa, they are integrated and introduced at a more merciful and narratively pleasing pace. And we are at the point now where Oda has seriously tightened and almost perfected this mega arc formula, which is a stage we never would have been able to achieve without our initial Dress Rosa experiment. Dress Rosa was 
art that needed to happen. There was definitely some creative juices flowing. It was one of the key turn points in the story. It made the world of One Piece even bigger than what it was before. But the practice in this arc really served to make the next few on Whole Cake Island and now in Wano really stand out in terms of their continuity and breeding ease. So for everything it took, Dress Rosa did pay back its narrative debt with interest. So much so that half a decade later, I think there's a great retrospective appreciation for it. And not just the good aspects, but also the bad ones, because a healthy dose of controversy is always fun. The thing about controversy is it brings the community together to talk about it. It sparks so much discussion, and I think that's incredible, and that's the best thing a piece of fiction can do. Is Dress Rosa one of the best arcs in One Piece? Yeah, I think so. I honestly do think so. No. Simply no. And I'm ready to argue that it is the best arc of the series. You can have a debate all day about what the best is. Top 10, yeah, sure. I don't think it's top 10. It would be like number 15. I still think it's one of the best story arcs that One Piece has to offer. It's the best. I think it's great. It's not one of my favorites, but it's nowhere near one of my favorite arcs. Without a doubt, my favorite arc in all of One Piece. It's very impressive for a piece of media to be that polarizing because it means that it strikes an intriguing balance of high highs and low lows enough to conjure every available human emotion to respond to it, which is why we're still talking about it to this very day, because it's always interesting to discover a new individual's personal take on the art. So I sat here and I watched people talk about Dressrosa for almost an entire day all up, and at no point did it get boring, because everyone had such a unique perspective, and more importantly, everyone was quite positive about the experience as a whole. It ups the scales. It had a lot of ambition, and it fulfilled a lot of different things. When I have like, a flashback to dress rosa i couldn't be happier with the type of things that we got it's got something for everyone backstories are really good awesome fights so many characters so many factions you get to follow all these different storylines everything was just unexpected but it was great it's a really good arc it was done pretty well very well made very engaging from start to finish and it just shows how good of an author Oda is so dress rosa may very well have been a disaster to read at the time as well as a disaster to watch at the time and an under disputed disaster of a Monopoly set. It is a bad game, do not play it. But despite all of that, it was still One Piece. And even at its worst, it is still far and away the greatest manga series of all time. Really, Dressrosa only looks bad when compared to other installments of One Piece. And in that context, what's not to love about the arc? Dressrosa was just a roller coaster ride. Where it had its ups, it had its downs. It was fun. I found it very exciting. I was super excited because it just, it was really, it was really good. It was just really good. It's good mediocre. It was still dope, super lit, and based, <laughs> if you want to call it that. I feel like the art just hits that sweet spot, you know? It's a gift that keeps on giving. It gave me Do Flamingo. We received an amazing and emotional flashback from Law. A really nice way to expand the universe. I had really good enjoyment about it. I still think it's great. If I rewatch it 10 times, it'll still be great. 10 out of 10. I love it so much. But I loved it. I loved every second of it. Claps to Dress Rosa. Claps to Dress Rosa indeed. And claps to everyone who took the time to submit their Dress Rosa opinions. There are well over 100 amazing One Piece fans featured in this video, and it was a pleasure to get to know each and every one of you. So I am now going to end the longest video of my life by dramatically cutting out all of the lights. It's going to be magical. So cue magic in three, two, one, magic. Hmm, I forgot about the monitor. And so, right, we can fix this. We're just gonna casually turn down the brightness and uh, cut to credits. Bye. Hello there. Popular One Piece historian Grand Line Review has put out a request, and I'm answering it. If you do like an intro thing with it, like waving and you showing the YouTubers, then okay, here's my little clip. That's my girl Avril Bean. That's my boy Link. I've got uh, my buddy Roranora Zoro. He's a lamp. Got my. One piece tattoo, first tattoo ever. Sorry, I'm recording this in my truck. Try my best not to sound too stupid. This is gonna be really cringe because, you know, French accent. Maybe you will notice that I have a French accent. I have to excuse my accent. What do you think of Doflamingo as a villain? 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 How do you pronounce that freaking word? What do you think of Doflamingo as an antagonist? <laughs> Edit this.
however you want. You have my full permission. Is Dress Rosa too long? So I think I'm going to have to say yes and yes, no. So actually, I'm gonna change my answer and just go with no. And yes, 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 so probably. But no, because yes, it is not. <laughs> I'm totally losing my train of thought, by the way. Why does my hair look like that? Let's make a super arc. You cannot have a good burger without a good patty in the middle. I'm not a crazy person. If you just wanted exasperated expressions, uh, I'm your guy. Um, I, 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 oh. This doesn't have to go in the video. I mean, it would be funny if it is. Hey, yo, Kobe, let me get a hiya. Hiya. Thank you for having me, Liam, and I'll put it back to you. Subscribe to the Grand Line Review for regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. There you go, it's not a shameless plug if I do it for you, Liam. Uh, thank you again. How do you stop- I'm looking forward to seeing your video about it, whether I'm in it or not, so bye!